Gaslighting. Have you heard the term? Do you know what it is? Has it ever happened to you? Have you seen someone doing that to another person? I want to talk about this idea of gaslighting in this video. I trust that it will benefit you. I trust it will give you some ideas of how not to be gaslit by someone, as well as how you can help your friends per chance someone is trying to gaslight them. Hello everyone, Rick Thomas here. We're helping people live effective lives. In a succinct form, gaslighting is the mental manipulation that someone does to another individual. It is a psychological maneuver of abusive type people who want to control you by making you believe that you are guilty of something that you did not do. And if the gaslighter persists, you may give up and even accept what they are saying, even if in your heart of hearts you do not believe it. Gaslighting is not new. It's been around for a long time. In fact, the process of manipulating other people, well, that's as old as Satan convincing Adam and Eve of a lie in the Garden of Eden. But there are many synonyms that convey the idea of mental manipulation. One of the first uses of the word gaslighting, it comes from the 1944 movie with the same name, starring Charles Boyer and Ingrid Bergman. The husband in this story is trying to convince his wife that she is crazy, that she is insane. But the term actually originated from a 1938 play, Gaslight, by the British dramatist Patrick Hamilton. The psychological community has been participating in gaslighting experiments for years. You can think of it as ways to drive a person crazy. Maybe that is an excellent definition of the word gaslight. Many of these experiments, they prove to be disastrous as you might expect. Anytime you coerce a person to think something that their inner being is saying is not valid, there will be an adverse psychological impact on the victimized soul. The most common modern word for gaslighting is the word abuse. Now I realize that abuse is a, a broad word term that encompasses many sins like verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, violence, anger, etc. And so abuse is a big word, but gaslighting can fit within that big basket word of abuse. A gaslighting abuser will use this technique of the deliberate goal to make the person believe the gaslighter's agenda. In a sense, it is a war of attrition. The victim of gaslighting may just give up after a while and just accept whatever the person is telling them to believe. As far as signs of gaslighting, there are two common ways to know if a person is gaslighting you. The first is if they tell you what you are thinking without adequately trying to understand your position on the matter. They ignore what you think, but tell you what you think. That is one sign of gaslighting where it may be happening. The second tactic is someone wearing you down until you give in to their perspective. In this case, you're just signing off on it because you just don't want to argue any longer. The first situation where they're not trying to understand what you are thinking, that's where you'll run into the statement maker, not the question asker. The statement maker tells you what is going on in your head without trying to assess you with thoughtful questions about what you believe. It is a brazen manipulative tactic that does not value your opinion. It's more critical for them to get you to toe the line than for them to do the hard work of conflict resolution. Many authoritative people are like this. And so that's the statement maker, not the question asker. And this second technique is the war of attrition method. They wear you down with their repetitive, repeat, repetitive drum beats until finally you just wave the white flag. Even after you surrender, you might not believe what they are saying, but you tacitly accept it because, well, it is the path of least resistance. But if you continue down that path, after a while, it becomes part of who you are and how you think. 
What I'm saying is the gaslighter brainwashes you. When a person senses gaslighting is happening to, to them, they should make their appeals to the gaslighter. I realize that this is probably a fail, that it probably won't happen, but that is the first the first, not the only, but the first proper response, and that is to appeal to the gaslighter to repent. This approach that I'm sharing with you, that's the template that the Lord gave us in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. In many of these situations, this biblical approach, as I said, it, it, I don't want to be negative here or pessimistic, but the truth is, reality is, in many instances, this approach will not work. You see, the gaslighter has a plan, and if he or she perceives the person as being weaker or manipulatable, they won't let up. They won't let up unless there is outside pressure that is on them to change. Habitualized, overbearing people do not let up. Before the gaslit person gets farther along in the soul shrinking continuum, the gaslit person, they need to reach out. If you make your appeals and, and call this person to repent, before your soul just shrinks down to nothing, it is totally appropriate for you to reach out to the proper authorities. Somebody must step up and intervene. Now, too often, a gaslit person, they won't reach out and they won't tell people, and they do this for several reasons. For example, they're not entirely convinced that what they see is real. They probably do not want to believe it. Good moral people typically resist accepting a worst-case scenario. And so one of the reasons that they might not reach out is because they're not entirely convinced that what they see is real. Another reason is they are hoping against hope that the gaslighter will change. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. You know, sometimes this idea of love believes all things, it just goes too far. You don't want to believe what you are observing, and so you err on the side of hope. And so a second reason a person might not reach out is they're hoping against hope that the gaslighter will change. A third reason is that they know that if they say something to the gaslighter, that they are going to burn a significant portion of their relational bridge whatever is existing of that relational bridge. And so rather than burning that relational bridge, they continue to hold out, hoping against hope. The gaslighter will change. The gaslit person fears going past the point of no return. And so if they do send up that flare, they probably will burn that bridge and then you're at a new starting point in that relationship. Another reason they may not reach out to others is that they have to weigh the consequences of doing nothing versus doing something. If they do send up that flare for help, they will have to live with the gaslighter after the help leaves. The help may come, the, may, the help may try to persuade the gaslighter to stop, but the help is not going to live in that relationship. They will leave, and so the gaslit person has to weigh the two possible outcomes. I do nothing, and it continues on as it is. I do something, and I live with the consequences. And so just saying you need to reach out to someone, well, that comes with a lot of baggage, a lot of possibilities, a lot of things that you need to weigh and work through. I talk a lot about walking in the Spirit in our ministry, and, and that means several things, but in in the context of gaslighting, the aspect that I want you to key in on as far as walking in the Spirit, trying to discern what you are seeing, it, it, I'm talking about your sensitivity to the Spirit of God's illuminations. You see, Christians have an internal clarity checker, and I'm not talking about your conscience, even though that is part of the answer, but right now I'm talking about the Spirit of God Himself as your internal illuminated clarity checker checker which will help you to see through the noise of of what is trying to what someone is trying to do to you 
You see, nobody can manipulate the Spirit of God, which makes sensing Him vital. But then the question then becomes, how do you know if you're hearing from God? How do you know if you're hearing from something else? Well, there is a way that you can balance that. There's, there's actually a fourfold checklist that you can implement. to. It gives you a balanced system to know if you are truly hearing from the Lord. Here are four ways that you can measure to make sure that, that what you're seeing and what you're hearing is gaslighting or not. Number one... What does the Bible say about what you are thinking, what you are experiencing in the relationship? Compare the relationship to the straight edge of God's Word. What does the Bible say about your relationship? Number two is this idea of illumination, walking in the Spirit. How do you believe the Spirit of God is illuminating your thoughts about the relationship? And then number three, what does a trusted friend say about your relationship? I'm talking about a courageous and compassionate friend who will speak the truth in love. Again, as you reach out, what does God's Word say? How is the Spirit of God illuminating you? This is how you balance your decision making. What is a competent, courageous friend saying to you? And then number four, what do you think is happening in your relationship? If you hang out on any of these four corners, God's Word, the Holy Spirit, your friend, or, or yourself, if you hang out on any of those four corners independently of the other three, you could make an error in judgment. For example, you could misread the Word of God. You could mishear the Spirit of God. You might not have a competent friend to help you. Or you can mentally tie yourself up into knots. But when all four of these means of grace are operational in your life, you'll be as centered as you can be, which will keep your thoughts, keep your thought life on what is pure and lovely and commendable. Now, if you are not being gas lit, but yet you think you are seeing it in one of your relationships, I just want to appeal to you that you don't take biblical propriety too far. Some Christians do this, and what I'm really saying is they don't want to butt into their friend's business, which is a viewpoint that is entirely unsubstantiated by God's Word. Jesus is asking the question in Luke 10, 25 and following, He is asking, Who is your neighbor? It is the caring person not the pseudo-religious one who is willing to enter the potential conflict. The caring person enters the pseudo-religious ones. They will not engage the conflict. There's an interesting verse in Hebrews 10.24. It says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You might not know this, but the Hebrew writer had another perspective even suggesting that we should become biblical irritants when it comes to getting into each other's lives. That's what he's talking about in Hebrews 10, 24. The word means irritate. Let us consider how we can stir one another up. That idea of stirring one another up, biblically speaking, is being an irritant. Now, I'm not talking about being mean-spirited. I'm not talking about being inappropriate. I'm talking about being biblical. The idea of stirring up another person has a sense of agitation. Be careful with this idea of biblical propriety where you just don't engage this person because it's too messy, it's just going to be a bad situation. No, we should be biblically agitating each other. And that may be a confrontation with the gaslighter, but sometimes those things are unavoidable, but we need to do this for God's fame but also for each other's benefit. Just let me clarify. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about being unbiblical. I'm not talking about being harsh or unkind or, or any other word that you want to use. But this idea of stirring up has a sense of agitation to it. Advocating for the abused, and that's what I'm talking about, it is at the heart of the gospel. Jesus came for folks who, who had succumbed to sin, and we had gone so far that we could not rescue ourselves. We needed outside intervention. 
which is one of the primary ways of thinking about the gospel. And we want to imitate Christ this way as we reach out to those who are free-falling and shrinking fast because someone is gaslighting them. If you are being gaslit and you don't have a friend, someone that you can reach out to, please anonymously jump on our community forums and, and just ask for help. Tell us what's going on, and we would love to advise you the best that we can. But really, your best course of action is to talk to the authorities that are within your sphere and get someone to act and, and to advocate on your behalf. Gaslighting, what is it? If you want to read a more in-depth uh, treatment of it, there's an article linked to this video and you can read that article or you can listen to the podcast. If you want to reach out to us about another uh, thing that's on your mind, you're welcome to do that by getting on our community forums. If you appreciate what we're doing with this ministry, would you subscribe to our YouTube channel? Would you share uh, our videos with your friends? And then finally, if you're able, and only if you're able, if you do benefit from these videos and, and you would like to help us to continue to give them away freely to others, please consider donating to our ministry. Thank you so much for watching.